Welcome to our second lecture that examines the connection between domestic violence and domestic violence impact on children. Um, in our previous lecture, we had talked a little bit about the history of the focus of, of research um, that started to examine how domestic violence impacts the children who are often in the home. And we also talked about the different types of exposures as well as the different sort of behavioral outcomes that children often display. Um, including internalizing behaviors, externalizing behaviors, and then as well as how those types of reactions can then sort of lead on to impacts within academic performance and other trauma-based um, outcomes. The focus of this particular lecture is going to take a look to see how we tie some of our classic criminological theories um, to help and use them to better explain the phenomenon of domestic violence, specifically when we examine the impact on children. So the theories we're going to cover, I'm not going to go into great detail about any of these theories. Most of these are theories that should have been covered in your Crew Jew 304 class. So I'm assuming you have at least a basic amount of knowledge about them, but I'm going to hit the high points and sort of show how some of the main components of these theories um, connect to domestic violence, especially when we're looking at children. So we'll talk a little bit about social learning theory, uh, biopsychosocial theory, as well as self-control theory. We'll then wrap up this particular lecture by looking at some of the policy implications. So we'll start with a general sort of summary of the suggestions that have been brought up in research over the last um, couple decades in order to help us handle the issue of domestic violence in general and specifically with regard to children. Um, and that will be followed by a, a brief look at two examples of ways in which policies and programs have been put into place in order to assist victims of domestic violence, their families, and their children. And then the reading that goes along with this will continue to be chapter 14 of your course textbook. So when we look at most of the social learning theories, at the, the core of them, the idea of learning theory is that deviant behavior is learned, um, antisocial behavior is learned, criminal theory is learned. And so you may recall um, Edwin Sutherland's uh, theory of differential association. Um, you may recall some of the other theories that, have, that were brought up about in the 1950s and 1960s. And when we take a look at the overall area of social learning theory, the key thing that you're going to notice that, that raises its head over and over again is this sort of this differential. And so what does differential mean? And we'll start with sort of the idea of from Edwin Sutherland's theory of differential association. The idea in that theory is that criminal behavior is learned, first of all. Um, it's learned from whom? It's learned from the people that you're closest to, your intimate groups, um, closest friends and family. But one of the... At, and one of the key cruxes of differential association is the point at which you learn not just how to the tools to engage in criminal behavior, but you also learn the motivations and the sort of the rationalization of why you would engage in criminal behavior, why you would go against the law, why you would do things that seem to be bad, but all of a sudden you can shift it in your mind to make it sound like there's a purpose to it, that it's okay to do that sort of stuff. And that's what differential is all about. Um, it's the point at which all of a sudden, as you're learning, as you're maturing, the point at which your mind switches and says, rather than saying, it's not okay to steal from people, your mind says, it's okay in certain situations because of whatever, or things of that nature. And so that's the same idea with reinforcement, other learning principles, as also as far as how we view ourselves in larger social situations and that social location. So when we think about children and their exposure to domestic violence, Ronald Akers 1998 sort of like collapsed a lot of these ideas to sort of summarize and synthesize what we can apply from social learning theory. And one of the things we see is within the idea of differential association, is that children who are exposed to domestic violence, their definitions and values about what is acceptable behavior, what is okay behavior, how to get what I want, those are inverted. So being kind to people is not seen as being a necessary thing because if they're witnessing anger and hostility and aggression in their household in order for the perpetrator or the aggressor to get what they want from the victim, 
the child sees this and starts to learn, aha, I can get something, I can get what I want if I am mean, if I'm aggressive, if I'm manipulative, I'm manipulative, if I'm controlling. And so we see um, that sort of aspect. When we look at just the idea of classic learning theory, even going back to you know Bandura and other learning um, theorists, we see sort of the component of differential reinforcement. Uh, most of us grew up in an environment where we learn through things like positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, uh, modeling and imitation. And throughout life, we hope that we are learning how to become well-adjusted socially. Um, how to, in order to make friends, I should be nice to people. I should share. Um, I should look out for the people I care for. Well, once again, in a domestic violence situation, this is sort of differentially turned on its head and children see the way that they learn about how to get what they want, how to respond to um, people's anger, how to respond to being frustrated it is going to teach them a completely different set of tools for how to navigate the social world. And then also we have sort of the application of what we call differential social location. Um, and so what this is, it says here, the abnormal adaptation of, to how one views their position uh, within the family and within peer groups. And so one of the things that happens within um, households with domestic violence, and we've talked about this earlier with other theoretical stuff, oftentimes rather than recognizing the complexities of, of a loving relationship or a family relationship, it becomes, it turns into a dichotomy in the minds of many perpetrators and unfortunately even some of their victims, where it's either the, the, those who have power versus those who don't, those who control versus those who, lit, who follow, um, things of that nature. And so what happens with the children who are exposed to this is the way they see themselves within the larger family is differentially changed. Um, the way that they start to navigate within their own peer groups can change, where they start to mimic and utilize some of the same behaviors that they're seeing at home, some of these unhealthy behaviors. And as we'll see in a few moments when we look at the, the biopsychosocial aspect, sometimes this whole relationship you see between, say, a child and their mother may be completely inverted. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in just a moment. So some examples of social learning theory, just to put a little bit more out there from what we saw on the previous slide, are listed here in this blue and yellow example. So households with parents who engage in partner violence provide opportunities for children to learn that aggressive behavior. Um, so in its simplest sense, that's it. Children learn by imitating and modeling. So if they see that aggressive violence, they think that's the way they should behave towards their friends towards their teachers, um, things of that nature. Reinforcing violent behavior as acceptable in a family environment provides a supportive framework for children to conceptualize and condone violent behavior in their environment. So once again, this goes into that classic idea of differential reinforcement. Learning is all about what things are reinforced to you and what is not reinforced to you as far as to learn how to navigate the social world. And if you see that violent behavior becomes acceptable, and in, at least in your mind, the victim, whether the victim is mom or dad or some other parent or other um, adult figure in the household, and they see that the victim doesn't seem to fight back or they seem to sort of get over it, at least on a um, surface level, and move on with the day, the child starts to think, oh, then it must be okay for me to engage in violence and aggression when I'm frustrated. And also maybe it can also teach them negative habits about how to respond or not respond when they are victimized or they are at the, at the receiving end of violence. And then the third example, the early maltreatment of children can damage their social information development. So this comes into that idea about the social location. How do you see yourself as part of a family? Right? I think most of us, if you're being raised into a well-adjusted family, you realize that different people have different roles, and those different roles adjust over time and with knowledge and maturity. Um, but for a child, all of a sudden, the, the way that they process this information, sort of learn their appropriate place within the household, is torn apart. 
Um, and so that can also sort of have lasting impact on the children. And then finally, children cognitively process the conduct of their parents, especially with the parent of the same sex and are more likely to mimic these behaviors. So it's not just the general idea of witnessing violence and victimization in the household, but it's also important to understand and for us to consider what is the role, who is the parent that they may be most likely to sort of attach to and want to model. And so if a child is really modeling the parent of the same sex, whether that's the perpetrator or the victim, the child's more likely to follow in the same path. As we move away from the social learning theory, we go into the biopsychosocial theory. And so the biopsychosocial theory, if you remember this, sort of grew way back out of our you know, classic biological and psychological positivism of the late 1800s and the early 1900s. Well, in the reemergence of biopsychosocial theory since pretty much the 1980s and definitely since the 1990s, there's been a recognition of how biology and psychology, what's going on with hormones and in the brain and things of that nature, um, are also connected to our outside social world. And so Corvo and Johnson in 2013 discussed two critical things from the biopsychosocial theory that I want you to pay attention to. So on this slide, we'll talk about the first of these two critical things. One is the fact that this theoretical area um, helps to explain the development of a violent disposition. Now, you may recall from earlier theoretical lectures that we had in this course that we sort of started with the idea that people who are prone to aggression, prone to violence, are more likely to engage in domestic violence. So, but we don't, didn't explain, well, how did you get that violent disposition in the first place? How did you become an overly angry person in the first place? And this theoretical area starts to give us an idea of how children can start to develop that violent disposition. So as we can see here, adolescents who are continuously exposed to partner violence develop psychological, neuropsychological, and psychopathological dispositions to violent behavior. So it's that repetitive exposure. So it's not just learning in and of itself, but there's also something going on at the neuropsychological level and the psychological level in general within these children's sort of maturing and growing brains. Um, and they're starting to internalize what they're seeing in the world. And it's not just becoming something that they've learned, it's becoming something that's sort of hardwired into their anatomy. Um, and then the other thing we have here is exposure to partner violence during childhood increases the likelihood of developing antisocial and violent behavior in the future. So research is showing more and more this, is, this area gives us an idea of where that idea of the violent disposition starts with. And we start to see this sort of you know, continual generational um, passage of this type of behavior that is often associated with domestic violence. Now, the second big takeaway that I want you to, at least for this course, consider from about the biopsycho um, social theory is an aspect which we all know, the mother-child relationship. Um, in most cultures, in most areas, there is a certain bond between mother and child as far as the caregiver, the one to look to. If, you, if you're hurt at school, if you have an injury, you're looking to run to your mother, things of that nature. But... What this er theoretical area shows us is oftentimes this relationship can be turned on its head um, or you know, thrown apart if there is a situation of domestic violence within the household. So let's take a look at what it says here. So maternal distress from partner violence affects the health of the mother-child relationship as the altered psychological health of the mother is correlated with abnormal social interactions with the child. So here, the unfortunate thing is if the mother is the victim of violence within the household, oftentimes her own health is damaged to a point where she's not able to be the caregiver, the nurturer, the, the strong shoulder to lean on that the child needs. And this leads to abnormal social interactions for the child, which can therefore have long-term effects as they go out and venture into the world. 
So when we look at these three boxes on the bottom of this slide, it sort of shows us the path that, that how this mother-child relationship is turned about and torn up when there is a situation of violence within the household. So we start with the box on the far left where it says the victims, usually in this case, the research is focused on mothers. Um, if the, the mothers, the victims are, you know, being victims of domestic violence, we often see them developing symptoms similar to post-traumatic stress disorder um, or also what we've seen in chronic abusers of alcohol. Um, so these are things which is anxiety, lack of focus, um, inability to pay attention to, to certain details, um, certain sort of fearful behavior when they, sh when they should be strong, um, sort of acting erratically, not being able to care for others. And so you can imagine if a mother or any other victim, since most research is focused on the classic um, heterosexual mother, um, mo mom, dad uh, relationship with a child where the dad is seen as sort of the perpetrator of the violence. Uh, but we can imagine this could be applied to many other situations. But so when the victim displays these symptoms, the relationship with their child is damaged. Um, and it changes the nature of what's going on. And, and they're no longer seen as the reliable nurturer, shoulder to lean on, caregiver, et cetera, that the child needs as they're growing and developing. So what happens is, as we move from left to right in these three boxes, is we end up at the far right, which results in a maladaptive characteristics within the child. Um, the child is now, over time, has grown up in an environment where they, they've got one parent who is the abuser, who displays aggression and violence and is unpredictable. And you can imagine a child's going to be wary and not necessarily looking to that aggressor as a source of comfort and safety. But unfortunately, the victim has also been damaged. The victim has started to develop these similars of PTSD and other types of abuse. And so now the child can't go to them either as a source of comfort and a, and a reliable source of, of care. And so how, what are the things that we often see in children who have um, been through this over a sense of time? One is they start to lose their sense of trust or safety, um, especially towards those that are closest to them um, and their caregivers and other adults. And you can imagine how if you lack the ability to trust or feel safe around your own parents, imagine how that sort of trickles into the rest of your life, whether it's towards teachers or members of the church or law enforcement um, or even close friends as you develop and you get into your own intimate personal relationships, um, your inability to trust is sort of continues to boil up. Um, another thing that we see when we look at this mother-child relationship is the reserve the reversal of responsibilities so if the child is used to in a healthy household is used to when the child is sick they know mom or dad is going to be there to care for them if they need help on their homework they know they can rely on mom and dad if they're hungry and their belly's aching they know that mom or dad will do what they need to do to provide them with nutrients and food but if mom is suffering from being a victim and she has an inability to focus, she is tired, depressed, has lost self-esteem, many of the traits we often see in victims of domestic violence, then all of a sudden the child at a very young age is forced to become the caregiver themselves and almost needs to, you know, be the shoulder for the mother to cry on. And yes, it's sweet and wonderful for a child to take on responsibilities, but it's not the appropriate sort of proper way to adapt and, and learn in the world, especially if the child is rather young. They're being forced into a sense of responsibility before they have the mental capacity to handle it. And then finally, another maladaptive characteristic that we'll often see in the child is sort of the assumption of the victim role. Um, where they start to see themselves as the woe is me um, because they didn't have reliability, because they didn't have trust in their parents, because they were fearful, they start to take on this idea of I must be a victim. And that also sort of stays with them as they grow into adolescence and mature into young adulthood, 
where they feel like they're the victim. And you can imagine that puts them into relationships and situations where they're going to have a higher likelihood of being victimized themselves. The third theoretical area that I want us to cover briefly before we move on is looking at self-control theory. So self-control theory is another theory you probably recall from your other criminological theory classes. And it um, came from work done by Michael Godfordson and Travis Hershey um, dating back to the late 1980s and then officially published in 1990. And the simplest idea behind self-control theory is that individuals who lack self-control are more likely to engage in crime, right? It's a very general theory. It's a very parsimonious theory. You know, it's pretty straightforward. It says if you grow as an, as an individual and you lack self-control, you lack the ability to sort of refrain from acting out angrily. You, re, you lack the ability to, you know, not take what you want, even if it belongs to somebody else. So this theory apl applies to violent crime, um, property crime, drug crime, the whole range. Um, but a lot of it then ties back to sort of at the, at the base of self-control theory, a lot of it says, how were you sort of raised by your parents or your caregivers? And how were you sort of socialized into the world? Were you taught how to create and develop self-control or were you, was that never available to you? So this ties back into domestic violence and especially the impact on the children because it really speaks to sort of that cyclical nature of the violence and the generation, generational sort of repetition of domestic violence, both on the perpetrator side and the victim side. So what's the cyclical nature of low self-control all about? Well, to start off with, individuals with low self-control are more likely to be both perpetrators and victims of psychological and physical violence. And then the low self-control of the parents is then passed on to the child. And you can see how this will lead to the child becoming more likely to be either a perpetrator or a victim of psychological and physical violence. So when we look at sort of the cyclical pattern down at the bottom, let's start with the box at the very far left, parents with low self-control. So all of a sudden you have one or more parents in a household who lack self-control. Then imagine that that person, one of them is the perpetrator and one of them is the victim of domestic violence. That's going to lead to ineffective child rearing. Why? Because people who are engaged in domestic violence, the aggressor is not going to, is going to be um, rash with their behavior. They're prone to violence and anger. Um, whereas the victim, as we talked about on the previous slides, the victim may fall into a situation where they are suffering themselves and are showing signs of depression, anxiety, inability to concentrate, inability to focus on or care for others. So what this results in is these parents fail to appropriately monitor the behavior of their children, um, fail to appropriately recognize when their children are acting out or acting inappropriately towards siblings or other children in the neighborhood, and finally, they also are going to be more likely to fail to appropriately punish a child, right? Um, so you can imagine how that may happen. They may, it may be a case where they, the child is acting out, doing childlike things that are inappropriate, but it may be completely ignored by the parents or their, uh, their level of punishment may be on the form, on, in the form of harsher forms of aggression and punishment than is necessary for a growing child. And so as this child has failed to be monitored, recognized of their behavior or appropriately punished, that moves on to the child as they grow receiving a lack of nurturance, a lack of discipline, and a lack of training about how to socially engage with others in the world. Um, so we think about which one of these things would they do. So lack of nurturance. So the child is going to grow up with, you know, lacking safety and trust in their mind. Um, they don't know who to turn to when, they, when they're really in need of help. Um, a lack of discipline, right? So the child thinks they can get away with whatever they want. And that develops with them as they age. And they think that they're their own boss and they can do whatever they want, whether it's socially appropriate or not. And then also that guidance, right? The training, 
the training, all kids are going to do silly things. They're going to do things that are inappropriate because they're young and they're growing. And that's part of life. So one of the best things about parents is hopefully they're there to set examples and also to train, whether it's through words, whether it's through their own behaviors, whether it's working with the kids, that training becomes a big central part of how we develop adequate self-control as we grow, how we know not to take food off somebody else's plate, how we know not to just take somebody else's toy, how we know to share our stuff, how we know that it's okay to not always be right. Um, and sometimes it's okay to ask for forgiveness or ask for help. All these things are a training that in an environment of domestic violence, these children are not re are receiving these things. And then this comes down to what happens if a child has ineffective child rearing and they receive the lack of nurturance, discipline, and training? Well, the child is never given the opportunity to develop adequate self-control, but they continue growing, they continue getting older, and next thing you know, you don't have a child with low self-control, you have another adult or future parent with low self-control, and the cycle starts all over again. So now that we've concluded sort of our overview of some of the theories that I think would be useful for us when we sit back and try to explain what's going on with domestic violence, how it can impact children specifically, um, I think some of these, the theories that we've covered serve as really good backdrops for us to start figuring out, okay, if these are the theories that help explain how exposure to domestic violence results in the different types of behavioral outcomes that we talked about in our previous lecture, how do we stop it? How do we fix it? And this is where the policy implications come into play. Now, the toughest thing about policy is one, we have to figure out, well, what is the best way to fix something? What's the best way to target the source of the problem and fix it? In our previous lecture, we talked about a few of the things such as mainstreaming, zero tolerance policies, and tracking in the educational system. And I just briefly touched on, even though many of these approaches ha on one side are well intended to benefit the child, oftentimes they have other outcomes that may actually be a disservice to the child or to the fellow students that the child um, is going through their, their years of academics with. So one of the things is trying to figure out like, okay, if I fix one problem, what are the ripple effects that it's gonna have in other areas? And that's always one of the toughest thing with policies, right? If we have, whether it's mandatory arrest policies, mandatory reporting, um, harsher forms of punishment, you can see how these impact not just the offender and the victim, but they have ripple effects. You know, if I send away, if I take a father or a mother out of a household and send them to prison for four years, already, in a very simple sense, you get an idea of how that's going to change the dynamic of that family at home, especially if there's children there, right? All of a sudden, they've lost one parent. Now, it may have been a bad parent, but it's still a presence that has changed the dynamic of that family. It's put more pressure on the remaining parent, etc. So with policy, we always try to think well ahead of the implications that are going to be out there. What this slide shows are some general suggestions that have popped up repeatedly in the literature. They're also referenced pretty heavily throughout your course textbook as things that have been suggestions for policy and changes we should either make or implement in order to address domestic violence. And what I've done here, and you could figure it out or reorganize them as you want, I came up with nine different general suggestions that seem to repeat in the literature quite a bit. But then I started thinking, well, who's responsible for implementing these? Like what area of society or which social institution should be sort of the, the, the holder of these and the administrator of these suggestions if we want to do it? And this can be a tough thing because many times there's overlap between who's in charge. And as if you've ever worked on a team project or something at your own place of employment, you know that there may be something, that's a task that needs to be done. But if somebody doesn't take the lead and say, hey, I'm you know, either this group is taking the lead on handling this task or the individual says, I will take the lead, oftentimes it never gets done. 
And this is one of the key things once we go from theory and research to actually putting our ideas into place is figuring out who is going to be the person who guides this. Um, when I teach this course in face-to-face, -face, what we do is we have on pieces of paper, we'll have these, the nine different bullet pointed things that you see listed in black print. Um, and usually I'll have several more. And then I'll ask the groups to figure out, well, who should be responsible, right? Who's the, the, the gatekeeper for these? Who's the one who should, be, who should head up these policies? And since we don't have that opportunity here, what I've done here is sort of a general breakdown of sort of three areas where we say, okay, this is, this is a suggestion that would tack into this particular area and this one would go into a different area. Now, obviously there's going to be overlap and you may disagree, but let's just take a look at some of these ideas. So when we think about, well, how can the courts or the legal system start to help us? Well, research points to a need for increasing the actual prosecution rates of partner violence incidences. Um, we shared one documentary uh, already in this course, and we'll share um, at least a couple more that talk about one of the most frustrating things for victims and families is when a perpetrator is not appropriately punished. Um, they either get off with, with, you know, a slap on the wrist or the, the charges are dropped completely. Um, there are very few things more demoralizing or damaging than not having the appropriate level of punishment because it, then it leads the victim to lose faith in themselves, feel helpless, and lose faith in our social institution like the courts and law enforcement. Um, another area that would fall under courts and law would be... The, continuing to push the encourage the encouraging victims to re, to reach out and report. Um, so, well, if I'm a victim, how do I know who to report to? And how do I know that it's safe to report? And we're going to touch on some of these things going forward. But one of the things that, that, that we will stressly highlight is victims need to know who to turn to. And, you know, do I call the cops? Do I call 911? Do I go down to the local courthouse? Um, how easy is it, you know, whether even if it's a restraining order, how do I actually start to do this? And how can I be certain that I will be listened to? So this is really where the courts and the legal system, they need to make sure they step up to make this whole process and these policies, you know, a pro, you know well, I don't know, well suited or available to the victims. Um, requiring of mandatory reporting is another area in there. We talked briefly about... Um, mandatory uh, reporting laws in our previous lecture. And this is another thing that sort of falls in this area. Then as we move on to the, some sort of social services, which is a very broad area, and what their responsibility is, I kind of picked out three that I think kind of speak to our classic sense of shelters and general social service programs. So the literature often says we need to enhance social service programs. Now, that's a very vague statement. Um, and from one article or one source of literature to the next, there's debates about what exactly should we enhance? What should we have? The key thing is obviously is making them um, available, making them user-friendly, um, making it where people can trust that if they reach out and need a program, that it's available to them. Um, and it's not going to be, you know, cost prohibitive and hopefully it's free, um, things of that nature. Um, obviously, also improving partner violence and child advocacy shelters. So sort of having shelters recognize that it's not just about the victims and in the historical sense was often sort of deemed to be, you know, women, but also it's the children and they need to have advocates within these shelters that know the law, know, you know, know how to navigate the courts so that they can work with the courts and, and also know where to find programs for these individuals. Um, one of the unfortunate things, not to give it up too much information about going forward, but when we start talking about different types of victims beyond the standard female victim in domestic violence, one of the things we'll talk about is when, you know, when men are victims, um, whether in heterosexual, homosexual relationships, one of the sad realities is, is there's a lot fewer services and advocates out there for male victims of domestic violence. And we'll see that going forward. Um, and also this idea of safe environments for children exposed to domestic violence, right? Sometimes you want to keep a child with, you know, the, at least one parent as much as possible. 
but sometimes that's not possible because the parent is either the aggressor or the parent's the victim who needs their own help. Um, so the pushing for more safe environments, and these can even sometimes correspond to sort of like um, educational and school settings. So let's go ahead and jump down to the third area of policy implications within education and counseling. So one of them, which is really school-based, is the push for offering more extracurricular school programs, right? Um, this not only gives children a chance to um, be active, and engage with teachers and other students outside of the home, but it also provides a little bit of relief for their parents who may be working multiple jobs. And it, imagine the frustration and stress that comes with that, knowing that somebody else reliable is watching their children. But it also allows the opportunity for whether it is teachers or counselors or whoever to sort of, or coaches even, to see these children, get to know them, to see, do they notice any of those signs of the behavioral implications within these particular children that may be indicators of something going on at home that hasn't been brought to the surface yet? Um, and it also provides opportunities for these teachers, coaches, counselors to be the people who train and model and, and show appropriate social behavior so that the child is not differentially associated or have, doesn't have differential reinforcement of the negative things are seen at home. Um, and then the final two that we see under education and counseling, providing early intervention programs. Um, clearly, if you get any of the ideas from some of the theories and the behavioral outcomes, the earlier we can identify that a child is being exposed to partner violence or domestic violence within the home, the earlier we can not just try to stop the problem at home, but also start to fix and help the child um, in order to get them to heal from the damage that's already started happening. And then mother-child relationship programs. And this kind of goes back to that biopsychosocial, the mother-child bond area where making sure there is an appropriate dynamic to that mother-child relationship. Um, and sometimes this requires the need of a therapist or a counselor or a trained individual to work with the mother and, and the children. Um, as we've seen with some of the theory, one of the, the toughest area or one of the most high risk households are young mothers, especially if they have multiple children. You know, just because you have a child, whether you're a father or a mother, doesn't mean that you're automatically equipped with all the tools necessary to raise a child, a well-adjusted, healthy child. And it's okay for outsiders, trained professionals to help. Um, especially if you don't have other, you know, well-adjusted models in your life like grandparents or aunts and uncles that can step in. So all these things are some general suggestions that we see when we think about policy. So I encourage you to sort of, as you're thinking about the court case or the cases that you work with on for your paper and other topics and stories that we see, think about where can we implement which one of these would work, which seems effective or less effective. But the one tough thing about any policy is we can sit here in this class and say, oh yeah, I read some theory articles. I read some research articles that found this and that is associated with domestic violence. And I think we need to go out and do X, Y, and Z. We need to do all those nine things listed on the previous slide. That sounds great on paper, but this is where the rubber meets the road. This is where all of a sudden it, we move from the academic side to the practitioner side. Who is actually going to coordinate and be in control of those services, programs, and policies? We see this all throughout society and, and within the criminal justice system, we see it a lot. Um, coming from a background of looking at corrections and prisons, one of the biggest debates and issues we often have is when you get a group of researchers and academics come into a room with a group of, say, wardens and correctional officers who are managing and handling our inmates on a day-to-day -day basis. And the researchers and the academics will say, well, according to research, you need to do this, you need to provide this type of service, and you need to do X, Y, and Z in order to get these inmates healthy, rehabilitated and back on the streets and back home to their families in a beneficial way. 
And then you get a bunch of the people who work with inmates day in and day out, rolling their eyes, looking at the academics and saying and thinking, you don't know what it's really like to work with these individuals on a day-to-day -day basis. Just because you think some theory will work doesn't mean it's going to work for everyone in every situation. And that's one of the toughest things about policy. And it's why we see policies and services and programs stop or die, die out or um, get sort of, you know, broken down to a point where they're a shell of what they really admit originally needed to be or intended to be. Um, so the coordinating of the services, programs, and policies, making sure somebody knows that they're in charge, they're responsible for getting this thing up and running and keeping it going is a very, very important part, um, especially with this uh, phenomenon like domestic violence. We need to have people who are willing to take a lead. And that's why, as we saw with um, the, uh, the private violence documentary, one of the things you have to really feel for are all these advocates and individuals who work with victims of domestic violence. Many of them are making little to no money for what they're doing, and they're facing the day-to-day -day realities. And they're trying to navigate the legal system, the court system, other programs and policies, um, all to benefit their clients which can be a very hard thing to do. So I'm gonna wrap up this lecture with two quick slides, just show, showing two examples. Um, and we're gonna see sort of who has taken the quote unquote, the lead to coordinate the services and how they sort of served as like a central repository. And that's one of the pushes as we're moving forward is if we have a central, clear, easy to access source and place of information, whether it starts with a website, whether it starts with an office building that has, you know, some offices and flyers in it, there's got to be a place that we can refer victims to that is available as close to 24-7 as possible and will be clear and beneficial for these victims and their family. So let's take a look at these two examples. So one comes from the state of Idaho. Um, so, and here what they've done is Idaho has convened, there's a council. Right? So it's a group, it's a board, it's a group of individuals who sit on this council called the Dome Council on Domestic Violence and Victim Assistance. Um, and so what they've done is it's create, you know, they've, you have this body of individuals who are working to take a look at what are the programs that are available out there? What is the cost benefit strategy? What are the laws that are in place? How can we go through? So they're taking the lead as sort of like as a council um, to run these things. And there's a link here on this slide. It's, it always comes up with this light blue. So I apologize for that, but you can still either link on it or you can always retype it if you want to take a look at their website to get an idea. So what do they do? Well, they're responsible for setting standards of counseling and treatment programs for individuals who have been convicted of domestic or intimate partner violence. So I read through that quick, but the key thing that I like from this is this council as in their leadership role they are the ones who are responsible for setting standards. And this is one of the toughest things with something like domestic violence and many other phenomenons that we deal with in criminology is it's one thing to say like, oh yeah, there's, there's a place you can go. You can call this agency. You can go to that center. You can do whatever. But unless all these agencies and programs and centers are working with some sort of verified, reliable, and valid sort of approach to helping individuals, you can imagine that they, in some ways, could almost further exacerbate the harm if they are not focusing on the best standards, the best up-to-date research, and things of that nature. So having a council who's responsible for setting standards of what it takes for somebody to be eligible to be a counselor or to have an appropriately designed treatment program is key. And then another thing we have here is their primary intervention goal is to positively change the attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors that will result in a positive level of victim safety and termination of abusive behavior. So once again, you can see the language here. The thing that I like about this is, yes, we should be punishing. Our courts and our laws need to be part of the, the, the story in order to get past domestic violence. So there needs to be punishment. But here they don't use sort of punishment language. There is to positively change attitude, beliefs, and behaviors. At the core, they're looking, we need to move forward, move to tomorrow. You know, rather than just focusing on punishing for what you did yesterday, let's make tomorrow a better day. 
And that's going to require not just punishment, but also help, help even for the perpetrators themselves. And then continuing with the Idaho Council on Domestic Violence and Victim Assistance, um, one of the things that I like with looking at their stuff is, is emphasize the importance of establishing both male and female offender rehabilitation programs, right? So much of, you know, even in the 2020 where we're living now, there's still a, a heavy reliance on sort of focused on male offenders, female victims. And that's just not always the case anymore. And so their focus on making sure that we have personalized offender rehabilitation programs is key because men and women are different, right? Different cultures are different, different ages, different um, segments of society are going to be different people. And so to do that, they incorporate a multifaceted approach to rehabilitating domestic violence offenders. And they focus here, I have a, a sort of a list of some of the tactics and areas that they like to focus on, power and control, right? recognizing, we've talked about course of control and, and isolation and things of that nature already, and the power dynamic, we talked about that too. So sometimes you need to teach both the victim and the offender. The offender oftentimes, especially when they are using these power or control tactics, right? It's one of those things that in some people's minds, they may not even recognizing that they're engaging in forms of course of control. And so by making them, making them see it, Make, make them become aware of what they're doing is one of the first steps to getting them to change and stop. And therefore, they can then move on to communication. We talked about how lack of communication is a major um, correlate of domestic violence. Building those communication skills is key for offenders. Relapse prevention, right? Looking for triggers. How do we work with somebody so that they don't fall back into their old patterns? Um, learning, teaching them peaceful conflict, right? If somebody has been sort of grown up in a world where all they ever knew was to get past something or to handle a situation was through anger or fighting, we need to teach them how to, there's other ways, peaceful. And then also awareness and utilization of self-control. So hopefully as I look through these things, power and control, communication, conflict resolution, self-control, these are all things that tie right back and were taken directly from the various theories and theoretical perspectives that we've been talking about. And you can see how they start to meld together into this multifaceted approach. Finally, we'll take just a brief look at the Royal Children's Hospital and Mental Health Services. Now, this is a segment, and this is the reason why I brought this up. One, it, it comes out of Australia. Um, so just to get our get out of the United States for a little bit, but also we, we talk about who's taking the lead, who's taking charge for saying, we're going to help. We're going to coordinate the services and the programs. Here it's through the Royal Children's Hospital. And they have, you know, a lot of other stuff going on. But one of the things they focus on is through their mental health services, they focus on families that are experiencing um, domestic violence, partner violence. And so one of the things that they focus on, especially is that aspect of helping the families and especially helping the children young, when before things, before the kids have gotten too old, that a lot of these um, learning and sort of adaptations that they've had, these maladjusted adaptations that they've had to life, before those are too well set, right? So it's easier to sort of help the child and get them to heal. Um, so they have various programs, such as the Parent Accepting Responsibility, Just for Kids, the Peekaboo Club, that are all work with the Royal Children's Hospital. And similar to what we saw with the Idaho, the Royal Children's Hospital also helps to sort of oversee and review the guidelines and the, the approach that these agencies and programs are doing. Um, one of them, they talk about, you know, rehabilitating individuals um, who are exposed to partner violence, um, finding ways to provide a safe environment for children. Um, they come back, that idea of the mother-child relationship. See that there? Build strong bonds and ties between mother and child. Such an important thing. And I'm not trying to ignore the father-child, but with many of these things, they kind of go back to that, the classic sort of idea of domestic violence. Um, informing parents about just how family violence will impact a kid, especially as they're going into adolescence, right? You know, and this can sometimes be something that's like, 
it, what kind of conversations are appropriate for um, parents to have in front of their children? Um, what things should be saved for later? What things should their children actually be exposed to so they get some sense of seeing how parents can sometimes quote unquote debate and it's not necessarily arguing, but if they're able to have good communication and then the child can learn there's ways to sort of communicate and talk out a disagreement. Um, and then teaching families how to provide positive expression of feelings and emotions, right? Um, and then also preventing power, control, and gender issues that are present in violent relationships, right? So we see that power, the control, a lot of these theoretical things continue to pop up and we will see them throughout the rest of this semester. So I'm going to wrap up there and I hope you have a good day. Take care.